Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for joining us on our inaugural Thomas Paine Breakfast. You're probably asking, what is a Thomas Paine Breakfast? Uh, well, the idea, which I credit to uh, the big brain of our friend and, and Free Thought Caucus co-chair, Jamie Raskin, uh, was to begin a new annual tradition for our Congressional Free Thought Caucus at the US Capitol. We have plenty of events and traditions in the Capitol that flout the wall of separation between church and state that overtly inject religion into the public square and into our public policies in ways that are hard to reconcile with the First Amendment and with the secular government that we believe our founders created. So what we really need is a secular counterweight to all of that and a flagship annual event that our Free Thought Caucus can host along with our allies in the secular advocacy community and allies in the faith community who agree that allowing this great republic to devolve into a theocracy would be a bad thing. So uh, this new annual event um, is intended to celebrate the importance of science and reason and ethics in a secular democracy. And what better way to do that than to name it after the great Thomas Paine, a founding father, a political theorist, known for helping shape our secular republic. So that's what we're here to do. Welcome colleagues and friends. Uh, this is the first annual Thomas Paine Breakfast. And uh, thank you, Jamie Raskin, for this great idea. Thanks to the American Humanist Association and the Center for Inquiry for helping pull it all together. And thanks to our workhorse staffer for the Free Thought Caucus, Jordan Shasha, in my office. From our modest beginning today, and it's so modest that we don't even have an actual breakfast, uh, we aim to grow a large and impactful event that will help pull our republic back from the slippery slope of theocracy and reinforce the principle that US public policy should be based on facts, science, and reason, not religion. We have a perfect team, a scientist and an ethicist, both renowned scholars to lead us through today's conversation on how morality and science are essential to a secular democracy. And I will introduce Dr. Mann and Dr. Allen in just a moment, but first, uh, Let's acknowledge the members of Congress who are joining us, my great colleagues in the Free Thought Caucus. Um, say hello, Don Beyer from Virginia. There's Don. Uh, Jerry McNerney from California. I don't wanna miss anyone, so I'm just looking around my screen. Oh, there's Sean Caston from Illinois. Bobby Scott from Virginia is with us. Jared, awesome. Su Susan Wilde's here, but not on video. Susan Wilde is here and showing up as Susan's iPhone. We're delighted to have her. And I am going to hand, am I missing any members of Congress other than Jamie Raskin? Because uh, right Jared, now, I'm here. I'm hello. Good. good morning. I'm handing off to Jamie Raskin right now to offer him the chance to give any opening thoughts and then we will get to our special guests. Uh, awesome. Uh, but so Jared, forgive me, did, did you introduce our special guest? I'm about to do that, but I wanted to let you um, oh, okay. offer cool. a, a secular blessing on this event before we do that. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, you know, may you may you all meditate and um, uh, deliberate in peace. Uh, <laughs> I, I I'm thrilled to be with everybody, um, and uh, but, but I think I've got an ulterior motive here, uh, which is my staff is reminding me that uh, we've drafted a. Uh, a National Day of Reason resolution, which um, uh, our, our friends in the secular community wanted us to do on the same day as the National Day of Prayer. But I think it's, it will be more effective for uh, the Republic if we have it the day after the Day of Prayer. So, uh, and it might avoid a direct political collision. So uh, I think we're, we're doing it it's, I think it's May 7th to May 6th, or maybe it's May 6th to May 5th. But in any event, it's a National Day of Reason just to get everybody uh, to focus on the central role that uh, reason has played in the progress of civilization, the progress of science, the progress of uh, governmental institutions and democracy, um, and the progress of freedom. Um, so this is what uh, unites us. And um, let me just say to our guests um, who Jared's about to introduce here that we are so thrilled that we've got um, amazing um, 
intellectual fellow travelers uh, who are willing to uphold uh, the, the banner of reason, uh, decency, and commitment to uh, the progress of public well-being and the happiness of each person. And uh, we, we consider you guys such indispensable players in what we're trying to do here. And our ranks are growing every single day. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Jared. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for your leadership and vision in helping us uh, get to this day. Without uh, further ado, I wanna to get to our wonderful speakers. But one quick reminder for members, uh, we're gonna to get to the participatory side here after we hear from our guests. Um, please uh, use your raise hand function in Zoom or just wave your hands and I'll try to see you uh, for your questions and comments. Uh, if folks are not speaking, please mute themselves. Uh, let me first introduce Dr. Michael Mann, Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science at Penn State. Uh, he holds joint appointments in the Department of Geosciences and the Earth and Environmental uh, Systems Institute. Dr. Mann is one of our country's leading climate scientists and among the many awards and honors he's received, uh, we include NOAA's Outstanding Publication Award, and he was selected by Scientific American as one of the 50 leading visionaries in science and technology. He was among the IPCC authors recognized by the award of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, his most recent book, The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet, was published this year. It shows how fossil fuel companies have waged a 30-year campaign to deflect responsibility and to delay climate action also offers a plan to save the planet. Welcome, Dr. Mann. And uh, he's joined by Dr. Uh, Danielle Allen. <clears throat> Dr. Allen is the James Bryant Ponant University Professor at Harvard University and Director of Harvard's Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. Uh, she has published broadly in democratic theory, political sociology, and the history of political thought She's widely known for her work on justice and citizenship in modern America and ancient Athens. Uh, Professor Allen's recent publications include Our Declaration, a reading on the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality, Education and Equality, and uh, a book called Cuz, The Life and Times of Michael A. She's the co-editor of the award-winning Education, Justice, and Democracy, and also from Voice to Influence, Understanding Citizenship in the Digital Age. Professor Allen is also the principal investigator of the Democratic Knowledge Project, a distributed research and action lab at Harvard University. So uh, welcome, Drs. Allen and Dr. Mann. Uh, Dr. Allen, we'll start with you. We'll actually ask each of you to go for about 10 minutes, and then uh, we will jump in with uh, questions and comments from members. Thank you so much, Representative Huffman. Thank you, Representative Raskin. It's great to be here with all of you. I love the idea of an inaugural Payne breakfast. Let it be the first of many ever growing such events. Thomas Paine was a remarkable figure, as you all know. A couple of my favorite features of his biography that are a little less well known is that he was a courier across the Atlantic of talismans of revolution and equality. He carried the key to the Bastille from Lafayette to Washington, which became one of Washington's treasures. He, in all likelihood, carried a parchment uh, Declaration of Independence, that's a ceremonial one like the one in the National Archives, uh, from uh, this country to somebody called the Duke of Richmond uh, in the UK, who was the first person in the UK to propose universal manhood suffrage, um, which he did in the early 1780s. It took Britain another 80 years to get there, but Thomas Paine was really turning the engine of enlightenment and emancipation throughout that period in the end of the 18th century. So it's a pleasure to be here in his honor this morning. And the work that you're doing couldn't be more important. We do absolutely need to rebuild understanding of the role of reason and truthfulness uh, in our polity. I wanna share some work done by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that was released last year. The Academy is another example of the spirit of pain. It was founded in 1780 by revolutionaries, by John Adams, John Hancock, Sam Adams, among others. Its main job was exactly the job you've articulated for your caucus. It was to ensure that the new republic had the commitment to reason, the commitment to enlightenment, the commitment to knowledge and the resources of knowledge and reason to shepherd itself through difficult circumstances. It is 
a secular uh, entity that focuses on bringing learning into the public sphere. And several years ago, any, a good number of members of the commission were worried about the state of our democracy. And so pulled together um, a, a commission that would focus specifically on the future of democracy. We released a report uh, in June called Our Common Purpose. Some of you may have seen it already. And I wanna just share a little bit about some of its key ideas with you and the place of questions of knowledge and truthfulness and cultures of learning um, in our country. The core idea in this report is that a healthy constitutional democracy depends on a virtuous circle linking political institutions that empower people that are responsive and that deliver equal representation to a civil society that helps people bridge differences and also supports the knowledge resources that we need for good decision making and links all of that to a civic culture that nourishes a commitment of all of us to one another and to our constitutional democracy. So a sort of virtuous circle linking institutions, civil society and culture. It's the civil society part that I really wanna talk about right now because that's where we are seeing our greatest challenges around issues of reason and norms of truthfulness, norms of use of evidence and the like. Here, it's really important to recognize that one of the original pillars of the design of our constitutional edifice that had the purpose of ensuring that our knowledge ecosystem was healthy has been knocked out. What am I talking about? If you go back to Federalist 10, um, to Madison's um, essay, he in that essay tackles the question of how to try to minimize or mitigate the inevitable problem of faction in a democracy. That is, of course, the essay where he makes the case for representation itself, the job that you have as the answer to the problem of faction. But when we read that essay, we often overlook one of its really important elements. It is the case that Madison expected that people would filter views of a variety of kinds through representatives and that representatives would have the job of bringing that process of enlightenment and reasoned deliberation to opinions from all over the country. But there was another element of the design that he thought was critical to ensuring that representatives could function in this way and provide us with that culture of reasoned deliberation. In the essay, he argues that it's actually partly the geographic dispersal of the country, it's, its magnitude, its, its expected magnitude, the fact that people were split up with you know, rivers and mountains and the like, the, the very size of the place would make it necessary for people to filter their opinions and views through representatives. His expectation was that those who held extreme opinions would find it so hard to find each other and coordinate that they would have to flow through the mechanism of representation to get their ideas into the public sphere. And that mechanism of representation would in itself be part of what was cleaning up the quality of the reasoning and thinking in the country. I'm sure you can tell where this is going. Since the invention of Facebook, since 2005, the emergence of social media, that pillar of our design has been knocked out from under us. So we do truly have a very significant job to do to reconsider how we actually build the institutional processes that anchor and support healthy cultures of reasoned deliberation. So in our report for Our Common Purpose, when it came to the question of civil society, we did dig in to issues of social media. And I wanna share some of the recommendations that we made there and then just make a final point about the work I think we have to do if we are gonna get back to a healthy culture in our use of reason and evidence. So in, we have a, there's a fifth a strategy or six strategies in this report. We're trying to restore institutions that are political institutions that are healthy, you know, a civil society that supports the good deliberation and that civic culture. In strategy five, we talk about building civic information architecture that supports common purpose. And there is a set of recommendations in here, and I'm going to just share four of them, four out of five. We actually recommend that it would be worth forming a high-level working group to articulate and measure social media's civic obligations and to incorporate those criteria in metrics that would track the quality of democratic engagement over time. So how can we actually even define and measure social media's civic obligations. Social media has knocked out from under us one of the pillars of the design of our democracy, 
we need ourselves to define our expectations for social media and measure it in relationship to its ability to support reasoned engagement in public questions. Second recommendation is that through state and or federal legislation, we should subsidize innovation to reinvent the public functions that social media have displaced. Local journalism, investigative journalism, many of the actual professional practices that themselves support a culture of engagement with reason and evidence. So for example, we, we recommend, we think it's a good thing that a tax on digital advertising can be deployed in a public media fund that would support experimental approaches to public social media platforms, as well as local and regional investigative journalism. You all know about the problem of news deserts all over the country. That is a way of responding to that. We recommend that to supplement experiments with public media platforms, we should also establish a public interest mandate for for-profit social media platforms. Analogous to zoning requirements used in the context of urban design, the design of city spaces, this mandate would require such for-profit digital platform companies to support the development of designated public-friendly digital spaces on their own platforms. And then we also recommend that through federal legislation and reg regulation, we require digital platform companies interoperability, data portability, and data openness sufficient to equip researchers to measure and evaluate democratic engagement in digital contexts. Now, some of those recommendations are pretty technical, but the point is that we actually need to bring the same intentionality to our design of social media platforms as the founders brought to the design of our constitutional infrastructure. They have fundamentally changed the architecture of our constitutional edifice. And for that reason, we need to bring the same kind of intentionality to what we ask of them as they play an ever increasingly important role in the functioning and structure of our democracy. I want to say one last thing here, calling on an example of a, a media platform that's grown up in Lexington, Kentucky, which is filling one of those local news deserts and is finding a way to change the culture around reason and deliberation um, in that community. Civic Lex has the taken on the job of providing investigative reporting and, and on local issues, county uh, decisions around water, for example, local taxation policy and the like. They've done a few things to start building a culture for deliberation that go against the norm and against the grain. In addition to having the digital platform, they also have in-person engagements. They report on the news in a forward-looking way, not a backward-looking way. So rather than reporting on decisions that have been made, they report on the agenda, what's coming for the city council, what's coming for the county board of commissioners, and do their best to equip the community with the knowledge people need to engage. But then in addition, they actually host events to bring constituents and um, office holders into space and conversation with one, one another. And they have a rule for these events that there never be more than seven constituents for every office holder. In establishing that rule, what they're actually also doing is anchoring a commitment to relationships at the root of the work they're doing around knowledge. This is one of the most important lessons I think we've all gotten from the last decade. The project of rebuilding a culture of truthfulness and of work with evidence also requires work on relationships. At the end of the day, people have to actually bear a sense of responsibility to the others with whom they're communicating in order to rebuild the norms of truthfulness, careful work with evidence, reasoned argumentation and the like as a part of our public culture. There's a lot more that I could say about the Civic Lex example. I think it's a powerful one and a lot to learn there. But a really important point to drive home is at the end of the day, achieving a culture of reasoned deliberation is yes, about exhorting ourselves to that standard, but it is actually also about how we design our institutions for information consumption. And it is about rebuilding norms of truthfulness, that personal human commitment to respect for others that is made manifest in a commitment to truthfulness. So thank you for your time. I look forward to the conversation. That was terrific, Dr. Allen. Let's go to uh, Dr. Mann and then we'll open it up to questions. You're muted, Doc, there you go. There we are. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Huffman, uh, uh, Congressman Raskin and the other members of the caucus. It really is a pleasure to be here with you today and take part in this inaugural event. Um, we really are at a point um, 
in uh, our politics and in our uh, social discourse today, where facts, uh, logic, science, reason are under attack um, in a way that the, the great Carl Sagan, who is a role model of mine, um, uh, foreshadowed, uh, presaged, um, prophesied, feared uh, that we would arrive at a place where basic facts um, and science uh, are rejected for ideological and political reasons uh, in a way that threatens uh, our um, societal discourse. Uh, so uh, Congress, uh, Professor Allen um, uh, mentioned the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is one of those uh, great um, uh, academies that was uh, created to foster uh, science and reason. The US National Academy of Sciences uh, is another one of those entities. Um, I was honored to be elected to it a, a year ago. It was founded by a Republican, in fact, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Well, the US, the National Academy of Sciences um, has weighed in that one of the great challenges, one of the great threats that we face today is human caused climate change. All the academies of the world um, have affirmed this as well. And unfortunately it is, uh, Abraham Lincoln's same party, the Republican Party, that has largely rejected what um, the world scientists and the US National Academy of Sciences has to say, has had to say when it comes to climate change. So I'm gonna share uh, with you um, a very abbreviated, uh, rapid version of my uh, talk here about my new book, uh, The New Climate War, The battle to take back our planet, which is about these challenges, the, the challenge to act on climate. Um, and I'm going to show you not model, climate model projections from scientists like me, but Exxon Mobil's climate projections from 1982. They accurately predicted both the increase in carbon dioxide concentrations that would result if we remained addicted, by the way, to fossil fuels and the warming that would result. Uh, they alluded to the potential uh, consequences. In fact, uh, their own scientists in this internal report described the potential consequences as, and I quote, catastrophic. But instead, ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel interests doubled down in a decades long campaign to try to discredit independent scientists coming to the same conclusions that their own scientists had come to. Uh, attacking the science of climate change. If we had acted decades ago, when the scientists like myself had established that we had a problem, it would have been relatively easy to ramp down our carbon emissions uh, in time to avoid catastrophic warming of the planet. What decade, decades of inaction, thanks to um, the lobbying by ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel interests and the front groups that advocate for them and uh, the politicians who advocate for them. As a result of that, we now have a, a much tougher challenge. We have to ramp those carbon emissions down very dramatically. Um, we have to bring them down by factor two within the next decade now, if we are to avert a catastrophic three degree Fahrenheit warming of the planet. And the impacts are no longer subtle. Uh, we see them play out in real time in our television screens, on our television screens, in our newspaper headlines, unprecedented heat waves, hottest day ever recorded was last summer in Death Valley, reliably recorded. Heat waves, wildfires out west, not just in the United States, but down in Australia, where I did a sabbatical last year and lived through what they call the Black Summer now. Um, this uh, summer where uh, record heat and drought combined to yield bushfires that spread out across the continent um, and did catastrophic damage. Well, a year later, this is that same region that was dealing with those wildfires. This is New South Wales. And that's not your imagination. That is a house floating down a river. So we've gone from unprecedented heat and drought and flood uh, and, and wildfires to unprecedented floods. Uh, we see the same thing um, out west, uh, California. You combine those extremes. We see more extreme heat and drought 
and that gives us the wildfires, but we also see extremes of rainfall and flooding, and often those combine catastrophically, for example, in the form of these mudslides that we've witnessed in recent years. Unprecedented superstorms, the most active hurricane season on record in the Atlantic last year. This is the face of climate change. As I said, it's no longer subtle. We see it play out in real time. The climate wars. Uh, for decades, as I alluded to, fossil fuel industry, those promoting their agenda, have sought to attack the underlying science. In fact, um, why is it? There we go. Uh, Congressman Abayer actually uh, attended a hearing of the House Science Committee uh, that I uh, testified in a few years ago, back when Lamar Smith was chair of that committee. Um, and here he was using his chairmanship to cast doubt on the science of climate change, to call into question the basic evidence of climate change. Well, and I won't play that, we don't have time. Uh, there's some amusing- Dr. Mann, your screen, is, your screen is not uh, showing, I think, the way that you intend right now. I don't know if we can resolve that. Uh, let me share it again here. Um, let me, uh, let's, let me try to reshare it and see what happens here. Um, are you seeing it now? No. No. You might just have to describe it. All right. Hmm. I'm not sure what's happened here. Uh, what I'll do in my remaining time uh, is to uh, point out that, um, and I'll just stop the share altogether here. Uh, the forces of delay of inaction can no longer deny that climate change is happening. Um, it, it's clear to the people um, that uh, they, we are witnessing the impacts of climate change. But that doesn't mean that they've given up. So the old war, the war on the science, um, we've largely seen come to an end. But we've seen what I call the new climate war emerge um, in recent years, where those same forces of inaction, uh, rather than denying climate change, are engaging in other efforts to block progress. And that consists of efforts to uh, delay action, to emphasize resilience uh, and adaptation as an excuse for business as usual, or to divide us, to get climate advocates fighting with each other um, so that uh, we don't present a united front demanding action, or uh, to deflect attention away from the needed systemic changes and policies uh, to action, to try to make it entirely about individual behavior to take the pressure off of uh, polluters um, and the need for uh, policies, incentives for renewable energy, carbon pricing, et cetera. Uh, we also see the promotion of doom mongering, despair mongering. If they can convince us that it's too late to do anything about climate change, it potentially leads us down that same path of inaction and disengagement as outright denial. And we see bad actors um, actually promoting that framing in, in an effort to really uh, to, to create disengagement uh, among at least some uh, segment of the climate uh, advocacy community. So the purpose of my book, the, the New Climate War, is really to describe those new tactics. We're so close now to finally seeing uh, the action that we've worked uh, towards for so long uh, with the new leadership of uh, the Biden administration um, coming forward with the boldest agenda on climate uh, yet of any presidency, um, efforts by Democrats in Congress, uh, both uh, you folks in the House and Democrats in the Senate um, to, to uh, put forward um, meaningful, credible, uh, viable, and efficacious uh, climate plans that hopefully will be codified uh, as legislation uh, in this session. There is an amazing opportunity now for the world to move forward with a regained American leadership and the impact that that's having on other actors. And I say that at the dawn of Earth Week um, as uh, Joe Biden is bringing together uh, the uh, heads of state uh, from the other countries of the world to have the beginning of a conversation now that will hopefully lead 
to substantial progress later this year in Glasgow at the 26th Conference of the Parties, where we will need to see the countries of the world ratchet up the commitments they made under Paris if we are to remain on a course to limit warming below those catastrophic levels. So today, we are at a point where there is great urgency. We're seeing the damaging impacts of climate change, once again, playing out in real time. Uh, but there is great urgency. Um, I mean, there is great urgency, but there's agency as well. It is not too late to act on this problem. I'll, I'll make one last point. Uh, a week ago, I actually testified at a hearing of the Australian Parliament. Um, and it was a hearing about media diversity, and in particular, the pernicious impact of the Murdoch media, News Corp and the Murdoch media that has a, essentially a stranglehold on the media environment there in Australia, even more so than here in the United States. And there's a recognition that they need to do something about that. Um, the Murdoch media have perhaps been the most prominent uh, and uh, persistent and impactful purveyor of climate change denialism and now climate change inaction, um, executing that new climate war that I speak of. In Australia, they recognize that um, and, and they're talking about what can be done to try to uh, rectify that. I would love to see similar proceedings here in the US Congress for us to begin to hold uh, the Murdoch media empire responsible for the punitive impact that they've had, not just on our climate discourse, but on our entire social discourse and public discourse writ large. And so I will leave it on that note. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mann and, and Dr. Allen. Um, Dr. Mann, you've given us a very specific, super high stakes example of what this war on truth and facts and science uh, is doing. And Dr. Allen, you uh, have undertaken the hard work of thinking about what we can do about it, how to fix it. So that's, that's a great way to uh, get us started here. And I see that Congressman Jerry McNerney is ready to jump in with a question. Well, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. And thank you. Um, well, those are two very um, stark presentations. I really appreciate you, Jared, for pulling this together and Jamie's uh, Raskin's um, <clears throat> and, um, influence here. My first question goes uh, to Dr. Allen. Um, you've you've described a um, uh, a, a way forward um, <clears throat> uh, to deal with social media. I'm on the committee of jurisdiction here, so I certainly want to see some of those details so we can uh, try and, and and get get that included in our thinking. Um, but I have my question is: Do you think uh, that uh, social media platforms could actually bring down our democracy. And I, I asked that, you know, after January 6th, I think there's something that, that we need to talk about. Is this actually a possibility in our future? Um, and then moving on to, to Dr. Mann, thank you for your lifelong work on this. It's, it's an incredibly important area. Um, I personally think that we're uh, so far behind the eight ball that we actually need to develop uh, the geoengineering tools just in case we have to use those as a last resort. And I, I, I have a feeling you're gonna disagree with me, but uh, <laughs> let's have that discussion. Um, Anna Eshu and I, our colleague um, from California and I, wrote a letter to um, the, uh, the, the, chief, uh, the chief TV um, uh, distribut distributors like, uh, like uh, Comcast and AT&T, asking them to explain how they can permit uh, Facebook uh, and uh, and Fox News, Murdoch, and all those to to distribute false and misleading information that's actually harmful to our democracy. And uh, you can't believe the negative feedback we got, of course, from the negative blowback we got from from the right wing on that. So uh, we're we're thinking about how to move forward and and trying to contain the Murdoch sort of uh, influence on our in our democracy. So thank you. Those are my comments and questions. Dr. Allen, do you want to tackle the part about uh, Facebook bringing down the republic? Sure, I'm ha happy to do that. <laughs> so for starters, no, I don't actually think social media will bring down our constitutional democracy. The reason though is not because of anything about social media, it's because our constitutional democracy is adaptive and has rapid feedback loops. 
So we have recognized the problem and we have the power to address it. And it's exactly because our constitutional democracy is resilient that I am not ultimately existentially worried about social media. I do think we have work that we have to do. I do often draw the analogy to cities and urban design. There is a point in time where sort of cities did just kind of grow in a higgly piggly way and we really didn't sort of think about the quality of life. And over time we have learned principles of design. Sometimes we articulate those through zoning, variety of other things. But so now we, we insist on green spaces in our public parks. We have traffic laws. We mark sort of the different parts of our sort of traffic zones. We're very clear on the areas that are safe for kids and not safe for kids and things like that. All of that kind of knowledge that we have brought to the design of cities, we need to bring now to the design of social media and bring democratic intentionality to it and recognize our own power um, as the people, as the representatives of the people in Congress to establish requirements for the operation of this kind of infrastructure in our society. So I do think it's a challenge of a very significant um, degree um, but I think ultimately our resilience, our adaptive capacity, the fact that we are reason users and, and, and can diagnose problems and find solutions um, is stronger uh, than the danger posed. Well, sure, please make sure my office gets your recommendations. We'll Dr. Mann, you wanna tackle the, the climate side of that? Yeah, actually, if it's okay, let me tackle both, uh, briefly at least, um, uh, because it, it, in, in my book, I actually talk about the, the pernicious way that social media has been weaponized in the new climate war, um, in particular by uh, bad state actors, uh, Russia, um, which of course has an agenda here, their largest asset, their largest uh, asset, the remaining asset is the, the fossil fuels that are still buried beneath Russian soil. And they have attempted to defeat efforts uh, across uh, the planet in uh, Australia, in, in uh, Canada, and in the United States, um, efforts to uh, actually act on climate. They've um, attacked uh, carbon pricing. They've attacked uh, basically um, any vehicle that has been promoted for uh, addressing climate from a pol policy standpoint, using bot armies and trolls. Um, uh, they divide the climate community uh, by um, uh, creating uh, conflict uh, online, dividing advocates, as I alluded to before. So uh, it's a problem both both with um, you know the Murdoch media empire, but also uh, malign state actors um, who have an agenda and have weaponized social media to advance that agenda. And I do think we need to address that. Now, with respect to geoengineering, um, so uh, thanks, Congressman McNerney, for uh, asking uh, about this because it is something that um, is very much being discussed today. Uh, in fact, uh, it's an element, uh, I believe, of the House um, climate plan uh, as currently proposed. Um, I do have concerns uh, about um, the, the potential use of geoengineering. I favor researching it, using models to research the potential impacts of geoengineering. Uh, and we're talking about uh, uh, other interventions with the climate system to try to offset global warming, <clears throat> like putting sulfur-based uh, particles into the stratosphere to reflect some of the sunlight. Um, and there are other geoengineering schemes that have been proposed. In many cases, the modeling studies tell us there could be some profound unintended consequences. We're messing around now in an unprecedented and uncontrolled manner with a system we don't understand perfectly. Um, so I do have some concerns about some of the specific geoengineering schemes that are being suggested. Uh, they could potentially do more damage, but there's another problem here as well. We sometimes uh, refer to this as the moral hazard. Uh, the forces of inaction that I'm talking about, and by the way, Bill Gates has his own book uh, out on climate change, as you all know, and, and he promotes uh, geoengineering as part of the solution. I would argue he does so by really understating the role that existing renewable technology can play. Um, and uh, so uh, there's a little bit of background noise, but I'll, I'll just ignore that. Um, hey, Sean, you, there you go. Uh, go so, ahead. Sorry, Doctor. No problem. Um, so there is the, the moral hazard, which is that the forces of inaction would love to be able to say, look, we've got this simple techno fix, trust us, and we'll be able to implement it down the road. Um, so mm -hmm. let us continue to sell and burn those fossil fuels in the meantime. Right. Um, it can very easily be used as a crutch for inaction 
by the forces of inaction. And we've seen it used that way. I don't think it's a coincidence that Rex Tillerson, former CEO of ExxonMobil, is on record saying that the, the solution to climate change is engineering. It's just an engineering problem because they would love to frame it as an engineering problem where we can simply engage in some sort of cover up, some other intervention to offset global warming while we continue to pump carbon pollution into the atmosphere. Uh, so that is that that is the worry that that I have here. Um, and there are other technical problems as well with all these schemes, including schemes to try to suck the CO2 back out of the atmosphere, what's sometimes called direct air capture. Can we uh, store it safely? And uh, can we continue to implement this? Because if anything interrupts the schedule of geoengineering, um, a war, uh, some other instability, uh, we could realize the full impact of all that carbon dioxide that had been accumulating for decades in a matter of months. So you talk about catastrophic climate change, that would be catastrophic climate change. So I um, am somewhat uh, skeptical and, and, and frankly somewhat averse to many of the geoengineering schemes that are being promoted uh, because I do think potentially they provide a crutch to polluting interests to continue with business as usual. We're really good. We've really figured out how to put carbon into the atmosphere. We're great at that. What we're not good at, what we don't know how to do, is to take it back out of the atmosphere. And that should give us pause. Well, I knew thank I was you, stepping into that minefield. So I thank you, Dr. <laughs> no Dr. problem. Man. Thank you. Well, and, and your, your very skeptical note uh, aligns nicely with the action plan we produced at the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Research, yes. Dr. Strange, love for the climate, no. And uh, we appreciate the way you articulated it. Uh, we're going to go to Don Beyer and then Sean Gaston and then Jamie Raskin. Thank you, Jerry, very much. And thank you and Jamie so much for putting this together. Um, Dr. Allen, I really appreciate your, your optimism. Um, and, and clearly what we see on the Hill are, are people operating with different sets of facts, different realities. We see it in the whole country. How do we reconcile our characteristic freedom of speech um, with the need for truthfulness, especially with proliferation of communication tools, not just social media? Because I'm thinking of the anti-vaxxers, the climate deniers, and, and especially the charlatans, the Rush Limbaugh's of the world who would much rather appeal to emotion than to truthfulness. Um, you know, in Europe, they will suppress much of this, um, you, but here our tradition is not to do that. So how do we get that resilience and the ad, ad, adapt, adaptiveness that you, you believe we have? Thank you, Representative Beyer. One of the hardest parts of this issue, I think, is that we often, have as our first um, instinct, the sort of desire to sort the true from the false and to figure out a way of blocking out um, the false. This is an instinct that also characterized um, our efforts in, in this country around the issue of propaganda in the late 1930s. A lot of people worked really hard on trying to figure out how to clean our political discourse of propaganda. And the work went through this kind of arc um, of evolution over time where it sort of started off that way, sort of effort to sort. And then people came to understand that, yes, I mean, you do have disinformation at the edges of sort of what the Russians are doing, for example. Um, and then you have the sort of problem of misinformation where people are passing things on without realizing its quality. And then you have the sort of issue in the center where the question of which facts are salient does actually depend on what question you're trying to ask or answer. And it does get very hard to say, this is a fact and that's not a fact that's pertinent and the like. And so that sort of sorting process, other than sort of the far margins with sort of disinformation um, efforts does get extremely difficult. And so the evolution tended to be to the recognition that what you had to do was rebuild processes, practices that could anchor this norm of truthfulness. So it's not that sort of upfront, you can have any kind of cookie cutter way of saying this is in and this is out. You, you actually have to do the really hard long-term work of putting people back in contexts where truthfulness will be expected of them. So that's the importance of that civic lex example is that in that sort of seven to one ratio, people are directly responsible to each other. And so you begin to rebuild a culture where that's the expectation people have of one another. And then that starts to build out to a higher level. So our schools are pertinent here as well. Work on civic education is pertinent to this for sure. 
Um, but at the end of the day, it really is a sort of project of relationship work um, that is about establishing norms. So then the question is what processes can strengthen that again? I put a couple of materials in the chat for you, the report, um, Our Common Purpose that I mentioned. I also put in a beautiful, beautiful report that I hope you will take a look at by librarians all over the country, okay? It's a report that was created by an organization called Wiki Wisdom, which uses a really powerful process of asking experts who don't necessarily have a formal leadership position, but are experts in their community to come together and deliberate about a hard problem. This report was made by librarians from all over the country, rural as well as urban areas, all kinds of demographic backgrounds and contexts, trying to answer the question of how do we deal with misinformation? One of the first and most important things they say is like, look, look, we are the information professionals in this country. People should come to us, look to us. And indeed, they have a lot of very specific concrete ideas for how libraries can start to re-anchor cultures um, and norms of truthfulness and working with evidence and helping people sort through information. So if I'm going to be throwing uh, recommendations at you, another one I might just throw at you would be you know, invest in IMLS. That sounds really you know, small bore, but actually putting money into our libraries right now, they are trusted. One of the few institutions left in our country, like the military, that's actually trusted by most people. So it's a place where you can build on strength, take their commitment to truthfulness, and really try to build out a broader culture of truthfulness again. Thank you, Dr. Allen. I think we'll go to Jamie Raskin and then Bobby Scott. Um, I know that Sean Caston was with us and has a question, but he may have jumped off. So. Uh, Amy. Jared, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank both of our great guests for coming and participating. Um, I should tell everybody that uh, Danielle Allen, and I don't think I'm making any news here because I think it's already leaked out into the papers up in Boston, is considering at the urging of many of her friends, including me, to think about actually running for public office because we need to elevate uh, the, the character and the quality of engagement uh, that we're getting in our politics, then it would be wonderful to have her. Danielle, I got one question for you and one for Professor Mann. So here's my question for you. Um, and uh, this helps to solve a practical problem that I've been encountering ever since uh, Jared and I launched the, the Free Thinkers here, the Free Thought Caucus. But, um, you know, our, um, our rallying cry is reason. And then generally, you know, a train of the other nouns, everybody knows, uh, science, data, empiricism, and so on. But to me, that doesn't really capture philosophically what's going on. Uh, your talk much more did in terms of recovering the whole Enlightenment ethos. Um, I think that the Enlightenment thinkers didn't really believe that you could have reason without emotion and feeling and sentiment. Uh, and I think they rejected the, like, the purely platonic idea that like reason is the master of the emotions and the feelings. I think they were much more in a Humean mode of thinking that the question is what passions and what feelings do you bring to the table when you're engaged in the process of any of the things we're talking about, science, politics, and government. So I'm just wondering if you might say something about the role of the passions and emotion in what we're doing and how you integrate it and make it coherent with our attempts to revive uh, the centrality, the primacy of reason and science. And then uh, Dr. Mann, I wonder if you would say something about COVID-19. Uh, you know, I've sat on this committee now for more than a year, a select committee on COVID-19. And it's really, at, at some point, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i have the chance to chart the progression of uh, Republican rhetoric, but it goes from, you know, outright denialism to blaming it on China to, well, we'll just let the state deal with it to the Democrats are squashing freedom and business and commerce and capitalism to uh, questioning the, um, uh, you know, the vaccinations and undermining people's faith, you know. But uh, on the other hand, there's a positive story to tell about the mobilization of society to deal with COVID-19. And I'm wondering if you would reflect about COVID-19 as a parable for dealing with uh, the climate uh, nightmare that we're in, that we're getting the same kinds of anti-scientific undertow at every turn, um, the same kinds of denialism, uh, but at the same time, society fundamentally, as Danielle was saying, um, you know, in our democratic structure has some resilience and some 
uh, adaptive capacity. So those are my two questions. Thank you so much, Jamie. I appreciate that. And thank you for sharing my news with folks as well. Um, for sure, emotions are a part of the mix. I mean, we don't we don't think just with our brains. We are whole people. And I do think that underscores, again, the importance of quality of relationships. At the end of the day, it's a, I, the third link I put in the chat was a Library of Congress panel with a number of people who are working on issues around digital media. And um, it was a, a very surprising panel because one person came from a sort of legal context focused on regulation. Another person came from a context of looking at the problem of racism um, and uh, you know, racial attacks and things like that um, online. Um, a third, the third person was from the Lexington, Kentucky organization that I mentioned. And I thought they would all have very different pictures of what we needed to do to get back to a place where people could think productively together. And surprisingly, they all actually had the same answer, which is that you have to actually rebuild the quality of relationships in order to reactivate people's ability to think together. And I think that speaks to your question about emotion. That is, if you come into a space where you already um, hate or feel averse to or distrust the other person, that short circuits reasoning. Um, and so we actually do have to work on trust building and trustworthiness as a part of the project um, of working on restoring reasoning. And that's hard to say because there are a heck of a lot of reasons not to want to do that. Dr. Mann? Uh, yeah, um, thanks uh, very much, Congressman Raskin. Um, it's a great question. It's something I've thought quite a bit about. Uh, by the way, um, I put a link in the chat box to a chapter that I wrote um, in my book with Tom Tolles, the former Washington Post cartoonist, uh, The Madhouse Effect um, uh, on geoengineering. Uh, and it's sort of a, a somewhat uh, uh, light um, and, 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 and humorous uh, uh, approach to discussing it, but there's some um, good information in there. Now, uh, with respect to uh, Congressman Raskin's question here, um, you know, I, we, could, we could spend an hour easily talking about all the lessons that we could learn from the pandemic when it comes to uh, all of the other challenges we face and, and certainly the climate crisis. And in uh, my recent book, In the New Climate War, uh, I've got a pretty healthy section in the final chapter talking about those lessons. And you're absolutely right. It's sort of, um, in some ways, it's a metaphor for climate uh, denial because we see all of the same processes, but they played out on such an accelerated time scale. Um, the evolution in the uh, arguments by uh, the forces of inaction, um, attacks on the science to uh, efforts to uh, make um, the practices like social distancing, partisan, um, all of the sort of standard uh, stages of, of denial and delay, we saw play out not over 20 or 30 years, but over months. And so, and so they were so much more obvious to us. Also more obvious to us was the deadliness of science denial. Um, we can literally measure the toll of um, the, you know, the denialism promoted by Trump um, and enabling Republicans. We can measure that in hundreds of thousands of human lives. And so it laid bare the deadliness of anti-science and science denial. Um, and the irony here is that, you know, a year from now, um, the, the pandemic, this crisis, at least the acute crisis, will largely be behind us, but we will still face an even larger looming crisis, which is the climate crisis. And far more people will die if we fail to act on climate than will die from coronavirus. Uh, finally, you talk about the positive or allude to the positive messages we can take away. We've learned all sorts of lessons, I think, about uh, the, our fragility on this planet. Uh, a microscopic virus can turn our entire world upside down. I think there's some, uh, some, some important lessons that we're taking away about resilience, about our fragility, um, and, and, and it provides an opportunity to start to ask some larger questions about whether we are on a sustainable path, whether we can continue down this path, a finite planet with finite space and food and water. And we're so dependent on this massive infrastructure that we've created to leverage the carrying capacity of this planet 
you know, no maybe eight or nine no or problem. 10 times beyond what it would be in no the problem. absence of our infrastructure. And, the, and that infrastructure is so vulnerable. I think there is a teaching moment. There is an opportunity to take some hard learned lessons from the pandemic and parlay them as we seek to act um, on an even larger crisis, as I've said, the climate crisis. Thank you, Dr. Mann. And Jamie Raskin, if you could hang with us for another five minutes, I was going to let you close us out and offer a secular uh, benediction at the end. But uh, the final question from our uh, Free Thought Caucus colleagues is going to come from Congressman Bobby Scott. <laughs> Can Devon um, uh, mute his, uh, his device, Devon? Yeah, or maybe uh, Julia or uh, Jordan from my team can can intervene and do a muting there, but uh, I, yeah, that would help us. Well, let's try to go ahead though. Bobby. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, we've had comments about um, how the problem has uh, come about with um, public health and vaccines, anti-vaxxers, we've, um, climate change. The area I've seen this ignorance take over is in uh, criminal justice where slogans and sound bites, I've said you can choose between slogans and sound bites or evidence and research, but you can't do both. And you have things like Pell Grant for prisoners, where you know if you give a Pell Grant to a prisoner, they're so much less likely to come back that you reduce crime and you save money. Or treating juveniles as adults, you stick them in a jail with, uh, with adults are more, so much more likely to come back that you spend more money and increase crime. Uh, and if you take those positions like cut Pell Grants for prisoners, you increase crime and waste money, but they get away with it. The only thing that's been turning that around has been we've gotten to the fact that some states just can't afford the foolishness anymore. The mass incarceration is so expensive that we finally reinstalled Pell Grants for prisoners and we're making uh, progress on mandatory minimums and, 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 and other things. Um, if, if anybody wants to comment on that, fine. But um, Dr. Allen, uh, you mentioned uh, seven constituents for each official for a um, community with 140,000 people, that'd be like 20,000 officials. Can you um, kind of flesh that out a little bit about how we actually get that many people engaged? Sure. No, so I, the principles are when they were pulling together meetings for discussion, they would use that principle. So if they had two officials who were able to attend, then that would mean they would actually only make space for 14 people. So that's the sort of structure of it. And then over time, you're trying to have as many as convenings as possible so that you're absolutely expanding access and the like. It's not an effort to restrict access, but so it's, it's not about the design of a particular institution, but just about a principle for meetings um, in a community that's about trying to rebuild relationality in the community. Um, but to your point, as well, I think your, your question also really um, pertains to Congressman Raskin's question about emotion and heart. I do think that um, in the space of justice reform, the most important work that we actually have to do is to um, rebuild moral commitment to human beings. Um, and to restore recognition that people involved in our legal system are humans with basic human dignity. And um, that is where we should start um, and end our work. And you find if you do that, you not only reduce crime, but you also save money. So it, uh, right. I mean, you, yeah. it all, it all, but the emotion and the simple minded foolishness for the last 30 years has been carrying the day, but I think we're making some progress just on the fact that they can't afford the foolishness anymore. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Bobby. And it's great to have you with us today. Um, before I hand off to Jamie Raskin to close us out, let me just thank our fantastic special guests, Dr. Allen and Dr. Mann. This was a wonderful discussion. And I'll just make one audacious promise about next year's breakfast, the second annual Thomas Paine breakfast. There will be bacon and eggs. Uh, so with that, uh, Jamie Raskin to close. Thank you so much, Jared. And there will be vegan bacon and vegan eggs at the same time. Uh, and um, but I want to thank you all for being part of uh, this very uh, auspicious uh, and magnificent debut of um, the, the new uh, Tom Payne Breakfast. I think I saw uh, some of our friends uh, 
on the, the call who are uh, I'm going to be working with on a separate project, but all of you will be alerted to uh, about creating a Tom Paine Memorial uh, and uh, getting a Tom Paine statue erected somewhere in Washington, DC, uh, perhaps on Capitol Hill, uh, which would be awesome. So that, that's something that's long overdue. Um, and I think it was Napoleon him, himself who said that there should be a statue erected to Tom Paine in every city in the world. Um, but I, I wanna uh, thank uh, both of our special guests, uh, Professor Mann and Professor Allen for uh, bringing together uh, the critical overarching civilizational crisis uh, of our time, which is uh, climate change, um, with the question of the democratic and civic crisis in America. And they're obviously closely connected and we've got to confront both of them uh, at the same time. So as Tom Paine would have it, uh, the times have found us. Uh, and if uh, seven people is uh, the right number to begin to rebuild those bonds of affection that we need uh, as the basis of dramatic social change and movement, then we are perfectly situated because I think we've got about seven members of the free caucus now. Although uh, with Jared's um, just ruthless proselytizing, we, we grow every day on the house floor and we definitely put on the best events. So I wanna thank both of our uh, guests for uh, increasing the visibility of the caucus and letting everybody know that we do in fact have the best speakers on the most important topics to open up uh, the urgent uh, political changes that we need in America. And we thank you both and uh, we will be in touch everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much. Bye -bye.